Guys are good. Good afternoon. I'm I'm Jeff Savia. What an honor to be here today. Tuan, Governor Dukakis, thank you again. Thank you so much for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time and to share some thoughts with you today. Dr. Nelson, congratulations on the recognition today. I loved uh, so much of your presentation. I particularly loved at the end where you put out sort of this open call for optimism. And it's a question that and I, and I would imagine that, that you, many people here probably get this question, are you an optimist or you a pessimist about this technology? I am an optimist. I've lived my life as an optimist. My glass is half, is half full, but I've struggled with the question because there are dark shadows that are cast by this technology. And it reminds me, and I never knew how to answer the question until I saw this great quote from the wonderful jazz musician Charlie Parker. They asked Charlie Parker once if he was an optimist, and he said, he paused and he said, I am, I'm an optimist who carries a raincoat. <laughs> and I think that perfectly, and now when I get the question, that's how I answer the question about, am I an optimist about AI? I am, but I'm carrying a raincoat because there are shadows that are cast and there, and there are risks involved here as well. Um, let's flip ahead, please. My talk today is about the ethics of, of AI and the work here at the Safra Ethics Center. Also, I have a role with a, a research affiliate with Sandy and his team at MIT, and I uh, lead emerging technology at uh, EY. And the question of, let's uh, flip ahead, please. The question that I came to talk about in essence, we're all here to talk about this. Who will be the guardians of AI in the world? And we think about this as the institutions. Who will be the institutions that that will be our guardians? And, and of course, and we've had so much discussion, and Dr. Nelson, your wonderful remarks about the role of government in promoting democracy and the important aspect of the Bill of Rights. And I, I believe that as we look around the world, we could, if you'd like, we could go from Algeria to Zimbabwe and we could cover what every country is doing, but we know that it won't be uniform. And we know that perhaps it won't even be robust. If we look to history of how governments and policymakers have responded with regulation of emerging technology, sometimes governments, this is the reality, it's not my opinion whether this is right or wrong, sometimes governments choose not to regulate. They choose not to heavily regulate. President Clinton did it a few times in the 1990s. He did it with electronic commerce in 1997, issued an executive order essentially calling for, as we talked earlier about self-regulation. We have examples that he did it again the next year with the Internet Tax Freedom Act and he said don't tax the Internet. I'm a recovering tax lawyer and tax lawyers like us thought that's why the Internet flourished is because we didn't allow people to tax it. But it's not only happening in the US, we can look outside this, look at China. I would posit that perhaps two of the most important and the most powerful fintech applications in the world came from China, from companies like WeChat and Alipay, and the government gave them seven years. Seven years they decided not to regulate. They said, we will not regulate this technology the technology is pretty good, and so we can debate causation or correlation, but they chose, they chose not to regulate. Uh, let's flip ahead, and of course, there's role for uh, NGO civil society, and I won't talk about open AI. We've discussed that earlier. I just asked the question, how do you feel about open AI as the guardian of the technology for the world? How did you feel a few months ago with what we saw from government? I think we all perhaps feel is that there is a gap. I believe there's a gap. I believe there's a gap in governance that government and NGOs alone will never fill. And I believe also that as we talk about the role of business, there's, there's too much discussion about the big five tech companies. And we were in Washington last week and we were sharing some thoughts with our CEOs and tech leaders in Washington. And I, I want to be careful because I'm not giving big tech a pass. That's not the, the intent of this. But it's about the other 
companies. What about all of the other companies that are developing applications? And we've been spending, I've met with representatives of 60 companies, 60 directors, sometimes full boards, sometimes risk committees, and talk about optimism. I came away optimistic. They want to do the right, they want to do the right thing, but they don't know what to do. Um, with no disrespect, the average director age of Fortune 500 company is about 67 years old. The average director would admit, if they were in the room, that they could use some help in understanding this technology and understanding the risks associated with it. They are craving it. They, they would absolutely need that help. What we're passionate about, we get so excited. Just imagine the Fortune, every Fortune 500 company all of a sudden has an AI strategy. Financial service companies had it, life science companies had it. Now every company has it. Imagine, so 500 companies, simple math, there are, I'm sure, some great mathematicians in the room. There's average 11 directors for every company, so the simple math says that's 5,500 directors. That's not true because there's professional directors in the world who sit on like eight company boards. And so when you look at it, really about 4,600 directors. That's not 10,000 people. That's not even 5,000 people. It's 4,600 leaders. Uh, if you're a hockey fan, the Bright Center here at Harvard seats about 3,000 people. You could have an afternoon session for the directors and a morning session. It would only be about two-thirds full, and you could educate the entire leadership of all of the Fortune 500 companies. That has not happened today, and they are craving it. Okay, so what are they doing? What is business doing today? Well, in 2020, there were 80 organizations, public or private, that's it, 80 organizations who announced some adherence to responsible AI principles. It could be principles from organizations like NIST or the Department of Commerce or from the OECD. Or the, that's it. There were 80. Today, that's measured in the thousands of companies. Everybody has done it. The problem is, is that that's where, for most companies, that's where it ends. And what does it look like? And they adopt principles like they say, we are against bias, and we are against discrimination, and we're all for transparency, and we're all for privacy. The words are vague. The words are incongruent. Sometimes they conflict. Sometimes you can't be all for privacy and all for transparency. And so they're struggling with uh, with those questions, and they're craving some sort of a framework. And so um, that's, that's, where, that's where we decided, and we uh, started this effort at the Safra Center here, uh, because we heard from so many directors that they were craving a framework. So let me just show you what we came up with. You'll, you'll tell me in real time, or if you have, if it's uh, bad comments, you can do it after, after the session. But we, um, let's click ahead through. So starting from the bottom, the, the blue layers of this pyramid, and this represents these actions at every layer. This is meant to be a decision-making framework. We heard from so many boards, we want to start with legal compliance. We want to start with, we, we want to comply with all. We call those must-do activities. What's level one? Level one represents non-AI laws of the world. We've already talked about wonderful comments about the Civil Rights Act is in this category. GDPR is in this category. Existing laws and regulations that impact AI development and deployment today. It also includes Caremark. Do you know Caremark, the 1996 case of the Delaware Chancery Court, where the court said we need boards to provide risk and oversight, oversight of risks of the organization. And did you know that there has been, it's, it's the hardest case to bring against a company is to challenge the business judgment of the board of directors. And for many years, most of the cases failed until a few years ago. You're following what's happening with Boeing. The shareholders sued Boeing because they felt that the, the directors weren't promoting really the value of the company. And so the court allowed the case to go forward and actually held that the board didn't do enough to protect their stakeholders. It's the first time the court has done that. It's, 
I believe it's an important decision for AI governance going forward. The Delaware Chancery Court has said we need more from boards. We want boards not only, we talk about serving shareholders and shareholder primacy, sometimes that butts up against stakeholder capitalism. The, the, the court in Boeing said don't forget about stakeholders. Who are their stakeholders? Customers and people on the ground who could get hurt in an accident. The boards, the court said you're not doing enough to protect your stakeholders. That will have a profound effect on AI governance. As will, nobody is talking about the McDonald's decision. Is that why we all came here today to brief cases? Where's my friend Robert, my uh, lawyer friends in the room who may put up with me briefing one more case, McDonald's from 2023. McDonald's is a very tough case about sexual harassment claims at the company, but as part of the decision, the court, it was about shareholders, it's about uh, board responsibility. As part of the decision, the court said, directors come in and out of a company once a quarter. The C-suite is there every day. We should hold the C-suite to the same oversight standard as we do for directors. And so that became incredibly important. So um, rising above, of course, there's AI laws, this, this level three of the framework we call conscious capitalism. And the more that we look at ethical actions that companies can take, we find that there's a series of things that companies can do that are not only good for the company, but they're good for the world too. Things like if, you're, if the hand of AI has influenced a product, it's probably a good idea to tell your customer. That'll enhance your reputation, it'll enhance your brand, and it's probably good for the world too. Frankly, there's a lot that is in this level three where if boards just knew about these actions, they would take them. And I've been heartened by the feedback that we get from boards, including one of the last points I'll make is that so many boards were asking us to go further and say, up through this pyramid, it's about return on investment until you get to the very top. And so many boards ask the question, what if we want to do more? What if we want to do more that's not about a return on investment for our company, but it's about a return for the world? And so there's a series of things. For example, what if you uh, an audit an algorithmic impact assessment and you promise to make the results public to the world no matter the outcome? What if everybody did that? May not be good for your ROI, but it's good for the world. So many companies asked us to develop actions at that level. We, we talked to one of the leading ethicists here at Harvard and click one more time. He said, this is a great framework, but you're not going far enough. Don't forget about fundamental human rights up and down every layer of this pyramid and how important that is. Some of it is codified, but most of it is not. Most of it is not, again, we're not talking about just the United States, we're talking about from Algeria to Zimbabwe. And, and it's not, and it's not uniform. So don't forget about fundamental human rights along the way. One more click. We were in Washington, I mentioned the session meeting with CIOs and tech leaders across US government agencies and allied nations. And they looked at this framework and said, we need this too. But what changes is this level three. It's not about conscious capitalism anymore. It's about mission-driven agency impact. Department of Education, Social Security, Department of Energy, they're, they're building AI systems to, to improve citizen experience. And so it's about agency impact, but it's also mission-driven as well. So I'll leave you with three, with three points. Uh, first, don't forget the opening of whose role is it? Who is the guardians of AI in the world? Let's not let corporate boards off the hook. And let's change the conversation from the five big tech. Let's change it to so it's, it's all companies development platforms. That's number one. Number two, it's, it's so important to extend and climb this pyramid and implore companies to get higher on the pyramid. And then third, not to forget about human rights at every step along the way. Uh, Tuan, Governor Dukakis, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.